that I was like, okay, these guys are up to something. <laughs> And what's, then what's the secret? Yeah, what's exactly, you know? And I was like, okay, now I need to find out more. But as I was getting more into it, my mom was noticing and she was like, "Wait, where did you come from? Did you go to the temple?" Because my mom's a staunch Catholic and she's I I applaud her as well because her faith in her Catholicism is just so beautiful and I've just watched her always still rely on her practice and connecting with God. It's been that that's the reason why I was even attracted to the practice in the first place because right. of my mom's faith in God, you know? But she started noticing that I'm going to the temple, you know, I'm coming back some days, I'm smelling of this curry, you know, smelling of incense. So she was like, hey, I think you're spending a little bit too much time with these guys, you know. All I see them doing is running down the street, dancing and, you know, making noise. They don't have jobs. I talked to one of them, he doesn't have a job. What are you talking about? Um, so I don't think you should be hanging around with these people, but I always got this attraction. And... She realized, okay, I need to cut something off. So she started cutting off my spend, like my money, you know, because I'm still under her care. She stopped giving me money because she knew, okay, it wouldn't be easy for him to travel to the temple wow. without money because as an actor, I can't just roam around the streets. <laughs> it was a little bit difficult because you're known everywhere. It can be a safety hazard. So um, I had to lie to her that I, I, you know, I didn't really lie to her, but I'd be like, I'm going to the club with my friends <laughs> in the weekend. <laughs> wow. You want to give me some cash at least so that I'm not stranded at night with my homies. <laughs> and then I'd save the money <laughs> and not touch it, use everyone else's cash and then Norm use that money and then use that to go to the temple. <laughs> no, normally people are lying about going to the temple so they can go to the club. But exactly. you're doing, I'm, it, doing it the other way around. Really, exactly. So yeah. I'm like, no, no, I'm going out. I want to go clubbing. And then I'm using that to go to the temple. And then so one day I remember I went to the temple. You know, I told them I'm just going to hang out with my friend. I come back in the evening and I see both cars and the driveway. So I'm like, okay, that means mom's home. Normally she wouldn't be home because I knew I could come back home. And she wouldn't know where I am. She wouldn't suss me out. It's all good. And this day specifically, I'd gotten books. So what the, there's, I met a lady at the temple and she gave me loads of different books, you know, Science of Self-Realization, Karma and Consciousness, you know, um, The Matchless Gift, which ended up becoming one of the books that I loved the most. But um, she gave me a pile of different books. And so as I'm walking into the house, I open the door thinking that, oh, my mom's probably asleep, but she's right in front of me. <laughs> and you've got all these books. And I've got me. all these books. So actually, I always wear oversized sweaters. So I tuck them under my sweater, <laughs> just kind of like walk in like that and, you know, just get straight to my room. Then she asked me, Ian, you know, where, where, where did you go? And I was like, oh, I was just hanging out with my friends. And like, really? You smell a little funny. Are you sure you didn't go to the temple? Then the book started falling. <laughs> and one of the books that fell was, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Yeah, The Science of Self-Realization. And the picture of The Science of Self-Realization is like this deity form. of It's like an Indian deity of, of uh, personality known as Vishnu, you know, with like four arms <laughs> and everything. And so my mom is looking at this and is like, oh, my God. These guys are really brainwashing you that you're lying to me. <laughs> you know, there's something wrong here, you know. So she immediately booked me a flight and she was like, go back to the UK because wow. you can focus on your studies and you won't hang around with these Hare Krishnas. So I come back to the UK and I'm like, <laughs> let me look for them. And then I found them. <laughs> in, in Watford? In Canterbury. So this was oh, when I was Can in uni. I was oh. in Canterbury, University of Kent. So I found them in Canterbury. And started connecting with them. Then Buya slowly found myself in London, connected with the monks in London, then connected with the monks in um, Watford. And then, yeah, one of the monks there ended up becoming my mentor, some amazing personality. And he touched my heart so much that after graduating, I told my mom, I'm not going to come back. I'll just experience some, I'll spend some time at the monastery, just find myself. And she lost it. Did she? Yeah. yeah. She was like, okay, then let them take care of you. Yeah, let them do together. everything. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. You know, let them feed you. They're doing everything for you. You know, you're, you're relying on them. I'm here dealing with cancer and you, you can't even come and spend time with me. How did how did you kind of feel around that? That was a tough one. Yeah. Because you know, it's like, oh, you know, you, you'd think, okay, maybe the best thing for me to do is to be with her and just give her my time because I don't know what would happen. Mm. But then a part of me was thinking, wouldn't my mom be more comfortable knowing that, no, no, my son is figured out and he can take care of himself and he can figure his own life out. Mm. Let me just work on myself so that I can come back and be like, here you go, mom. You yeah. have a, a redefined man um, who can kind of live his own life. 100%. Yeah, so I knew, you know, going back home would be like a cheap skate. But me maybe going through this journey into the unknown and kind of diving into this wisdom would be a better thing for me to do for her. 
and uh, and yeah, and that's what I decided to do. So it was a bit tough. And in the beginning, we fought a lot. My mom and I, we fight all the time. We have this like very interesting, you know, um, argumentative relationship. I and I, we're always arguing. And but it's out of love. It's, it's like love, a sweet. Yeah. It's such a sweet relationship. I love my mom to bits. But yeah, we went through that a bit. And you know, she didn't understand it for a while. And I also didn't understand what I was doing. And I think a mother's natural desire is just to know that my kid is okay you yeah, know? yeah um and i wasn't giving her much information i'm in a different country covid's happened you know she can't even come in mm-hmm. come in to check on me you know so it was a bit mad but um after a while she got the hang of it she appreciated the fact that you know i took a bit more of a positive life change i wasn't you know inspired by going to the club all the time and getting drunk That's and fair, yeah. you know we're hearing so many stories about my some of my friends who you know got lost in the whirlwind of intoxication having to go to rehab and all these things so a part of her felt you know maybe this was a good decision you made and i'm going to support you because i'm your mom and i love you you know i I, th- I think sometimes the difficult things is is when we don't understand something we generally put it in a negative uh, we, we kind of put it in a negative world of like, oh, this, you know, they might uh, taint my son or exactly. they might, you yeah. know, do something to kind of like stray him off the path or that's something it, like that. That's it. People generally get worried about something that there probably isn't really anything to worry about. To worry about. about. No, exactly. You know, like I was being fed every day. You know, I had a place to stay. I had food. Everything was provided for us in the monastery. But I remember yeah, actually when my mom called, I made her have a phone call with my mentor at least once. Oh, I was like, you know, okay. just have a chat with him so at least you can see. And they had a video call. Did she give him a load of grief? And actually, she didn't. <laughs> Did she? I was expecting her to be all guns blazing. But she just said, you know, at the end of the day, I just want my son to be okay. So you just promise me you're going to take care of my son and that he's in good hands and that I don't need to have anxiety. Mm. And uh, yeah, he was like... I got you on that one. Don't worry, he'll be good. And it turned out to be for the better. And yes, yeah, so I did that for three years. This was from 2019 to 2022. Around the time when I met you, actually, because I met you in 2022, yeah. um, in April. Um, and then, yeah, towards the end of 2022, I moved out the monastery. And then now I'm kind of situating myself in, quote unquote, the real world and trying to maneuver it. But I'm maneuvering it a little bit differently because I've got this wisdom as well of these teachings that can be quite valuable for the postmodern psyche, mm. which I think is missing out on all this information because we've kind of just shifted to the side, you know? Yeah. Um, so now I'm in this like journey of how can I be an instrument of sharing wisdom that's valuable for people's consciousness whilst they live their everyday lives, you know? So it's like, I went to the monastery so you don't have to. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I kind of give those keys to individuals to live a happier life. Do, do, do you know um, one of the things that you mentioned, which is it's a bit hard to see for a lot of people, but right. you know when you kind of follow something that you your intuition is telling you like, oh, I want to follow this. I want to, you don't know where it's going to lead, mm. but it's it's kind of, it's really quite challenging because you're, you're, you're in this old, like this familiar place you're used to, this comfortable world, but you want to kind of grow beyond that and experience new things. And it's, it must be quite mentally challenging because you've got your mum as an example or even right. other people that'd be like, no, stay the same. Why do you need to change? Why do you need to change? Yeah. What What, what did you feel like you were really getting from the situation that was giving you more than what you may have already had or or didn't have. I mean, yeah, the journey to the unknown can be quite, it's quite a daunting thing, Mm. you know. Um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I had no understanding of what this would lead to. I mean, I'd already worked so hard as an actor, built a foundation for my life that would, you know, ensure that I don't have to worry uh, materially or financially, Mm. you know. And then now I'm kind of, abandoning all that to enter into this reality that you know my is a total shift from everything i've ever known understood it's considered to be like you know indian culture although it's really for everyone Mm. but these vedic teachings are just so different from what i've ever known you know so there's a lot of fear a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety am i making the right choice a lot of doubt you know um but i think there's just this inner resolve of, you know, just take this jump. Like, what are you going to lose anyway? You yeah, know? yes. Fair. And I, I think life at times puts us into these positions that if you, you know, if you do like an analysis of it and you think about it, you're like, okay, 
I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to work out, but my heart's driving me here. Let me just go for it. Worst case, worst comes to worst. This is what I learned. Mm. And it's a lesson and I'll move on from it, you know. And, and it's very much like, what have you really got to lose as well? Exactly. Uh, you know? It's just time. But then if you don't, if you learn something from it, then then you haven't lost anything. You haven't you've lost only, anything. You, yeah. It's just you know? something to gain. Yeah. And I think I'd met such lovely people in in that space mm. who were... Uh, so confident and actually i could say even for myself something i haven't shared already is uh i didn't have like the best example of men in my life you know wow. most of my uncles were are alcoholics and you know they were they, they didn't really live like the perfect example of what a man should be like in my eyes mm. and so i always veered away from masculine energy because i found it quite traumatic yeah you know my my stepfather was a little bit abusive you know well not to me but more so to my mom and i would observe it and my uncles obviously were like drenched in intoxication and just in this bad world so i didn't have a good example of men in my life and your fa father you yeah my biological father he had left my life when i was young okay so they separated right. with my mom when i was young and he didn't really make an active effort to connect to me in my youth so i just i always had like a bad sting in my mouth mm -hmm. every time i was thinking about masculine energy but then now i come to this space and i find you know happy vulnerable emotional men yeah who yeah. are not afraid to open their hearts who are not afraid to say how they feel who are confident in who they are who are confident in their emotions even in sadness mm. so i was like wow i've never experienced this before because with um my awareness of masculine energy was that you put up a front you perform mm. you know you have to show this macho you know i've got my yeah. shit together kind of vibe yeah, yeah <laughs> you a, know? Bit, a bit of toxicity there yeah you know, yeah and then now i'm in this space and you know you're getting all these you know examples of men who are mature and are confident within themselves who can cry who are emotional mm. so i thought you know what I'd rather make this jump and see what it is as much as I don't know what's going to come out of it. Let me do it and see where I come up the other side. And yeah, it turned out for the best. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did you not ever um, get that feeling from uh, being a Catholic, that that vibe, that energy? I yeah, no, I didn't. It, it didn't hit the same. You know, I know for some people it does. Like I have a few friends who, you know, because I was in. In the Catholic Church, I did like catechism and I was working my way to be an altar boy at some point. Oh, so like okay. I was kind of still in the monastic vibe. Um, and I know some people who did that and they turned out to be great. Like they had a beautiful experience. But for me, I didn't get the same thing. And then also in my youth, I did get assaulted. Um by someone who was in the religious space, who Boy. was in that, you know, and Obviously, Sorry. that does kind of mess up with your mind as well, because it's like, no, no, I'm coming here for God, and then this is what's happening. So I didn't get the best example there. Mm -hmm. um, although I could see where there's, there's positivity there, but just my own experience yeah. subjectively was a little bit not the best. But when I went to the temple and I met, especially my mentor, I saw this guy and I was like, dude, you're so cool <laughs> and you're so real and you're not performing for me you're just being yourself and i was like i want to be around people who are being themselves as an actor we kind of have to you, put a mask on you're putting a time. mask on yeah. all the time and your success is to the degree by which you can put a mask on so well that others believe it's you mm. you know um and that can be tiring in itself it's exhausting it? yeah, i think yeah. i think actors are the craziest people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, i was thinking about yeah. it the other day about how you know they've got a laugh on set they got to cry on set they got to do all these different emotions right and that must be quite a weight to have to, yeah. To kind of, how did you find the acting in Kenya? What was that? Uh... I mean, the acting industry in Kenya is, is I'd say it's the same. I, I didn't see much of a difference, but naturally you're trying to, you know, present emotions and feelings to the localized psyche. So you're trying to connect with like the Kenyan populace oh, and right. how they feel so which must have been a difficult for you because you was always trying to think outside of the box exactly and, and, then and I'm not different. be like yeah. exactly and yeah. then I also you know as a boy and I, you know I grew up around so many women because I veered away from the men mm -hmm. and I was quite feminine and you know super flamboyant in my expression I was it was just such a different to be able to entertain um you know the local Kenyan boy mm -hmm. you know I found it to be so difficult and um you know quite challenging 
challenging for me because I didn't feel like I fit into that box of, yeah. you know, what a guy is supposed to be like. You know, I'm super feminine. I, you know, I act a little bit different. I mean, my voice is way higher than right now. Thank God for jeans kind of, you know, basing me up a bit. <laughs> but, you know, before it was crazy. So, um, so, so, so coming yeah. to the UK was almost like a, a blessing for you, really. It was. Yeah. It was. And you know what? Ever since I was young, I used to watch like BBC and stuff. And I would be like, I'll find my way to London. <laughs> and this... This really affirmed because I learned about the law of attraction and um, we learn about this from the Vedic teachings as well. How, you know, if you set a, uh, an intention in Sanskrit, it's called a sankalpa. When you set a sankalpa in your life and you have that pure intention to use it for good, that the universe starts to make these arrangements to make it happen. So I remember when I landed in London, I was like, yeah, I remember you know, ever since I was a kid being like, I want to be here. Mm. And so it was an escape. It was a perfect I, escape. I, I believe in it as, I believe in that as well. It's just like a form of manifestation, isn't it? Yeah. And and I, I think, um, you know, you've, you, you've got to be careful with your mind because it can either work for you or work against you. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's almost like believing is then becoming, yeah. like by believing it's going to happen, it will, it will it become, will, yeah. it will, you remember that song? There's a song, I don't know if you remember it by, um, what were they called? But the, I forget the name of this girl group, but she's just saying, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it, right? Well, yeah, that, <laughs> that's know? the other thing. Cause, yeah, because at times, you, yeah, time yeah. you don't, you, your mind might give, you might attract something that you don't really want and then, mm. you know, it lands. And and, 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 and and that was something that I, I, I was wanting to ask you is that in the Harry Krishna world, it's, it's very much like uh, they they promote being content in life and and like being happy with everything that you've got. But how do you live kind of like a fulfilled life and a prosperous life if if it's just about being content with what you have? So essentially, you don't need anything else. Right. So I, yeah, I, yeah. How do you I, I, I struggled with it a lot and I still struggle with it, understanding it today. Yeah. I'm honest with you. Yeah. I remember my mentor, he gave me a statement um, and he said, spirituality or going deep into your spiritual practice doesn't mean that you don't own anything it means that nothing owns you. So it doesn't mean that you give up having goals, aspirations or dreams or targets or things that you want to achieve because you just have to be content with whatever comes. There is scope for that as well. You have personalities who are content with what comes and that satisfies them. But um, it's just that, you know, you are striving for something greater if you if you are striving for something greater but you're not letting that define you you're not letting whatever you're trying to achieve define you who you are as a person so it's more so it's detachment in a different kind of way not how we normally perceive detachment is that you don't care yeah but it's yeah. not that you don't care it's just that it doesn't affect you or hold you with the same clutch that it would have if you you know, for somebody, let's say they think, I remember one time I went on the street and I was talking to this girl who I'd met and I'd asked her, you know, what do you, what's your goal in life? Would you? And she told me and she looked at me and she was like, she wants to be on Love Island, you know? <laughs> and for her, that's like the thing. And she was like, if she doesn't get to Love Island, you know, it will destroy her as a person. So, you know, I wouldn't say that it's wrong to have that as a goal. I mean, you know, you could challenge that and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know about this, sis. But <laughs> if she maybe tries or attempts to get to Love Island and it doesn't happen, will that change who she is as a person? If it's going to affect her, mm -hmm. then maybe her attachment to going on Love Island might not be a good attachment. Yeah, that's, that's but, fair. You know, so, that's fair. But if, let's say she, um, you know, hopes to one day achieve that and maybe works her way towards that. And even if she doesn't get it, you know, it doesn't redefine who she is as a person or make her feel less than, mm. then she's still striving for the goal, but she's not being overly affected by it. So, And, and, yeah. and I, f I think there's a lot to be said about who you become along the journey as well. Right. I, right. I don't think you, it's always about the end destination. It's, it's what a you journey, got, right? Yeah, you got yeah. to grow into it and, and I, I think that sometimes when we're too fixated on the wrong things, we might miss the opportunity to learn and yeah. grow as opposed to like just flowing with it and That's what will be, it. will be like. Yeah. And I think a journey brings you so many realizations, isn't it? Like, you know, you could go on this 100%. journey and then realize actually at the end of the day, this is probably not what I want to do. Mm. So, you know, but it's thanks to you going through that journey that you got that clarity that yeah. maybe I need to change direction. I need to try something different. So, you know, this power in, 
experiencing that and 100%. getting that validation that maybe I need to do something better, you know? It's, it's just basically like chapters yeah. in your life. And I, I think the challenge is to know when it's time to change a chapter or even stay in the same in place same, yeah you know i think that's the the thing that we're always trying to figure out all the time where yeah. along the journey is like okay i'm not getting fulfilled enough from what i'm doing mm. i need a change i need a change yeah. or, or um or i need to really stick with what i'm doing because the magic hasn't really hasn't started really happened yeah yeah, 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 and, yeah and that's always the balance um, yeah i remember my mentor telling me that naturally what happens is you get this tension there's like a subtle tension mm. that begins to brew not just within your mind but also within your body you know your body keeps a score um it naturally it responds to your consciousness and so if let's say you're destined to make a change in your life, but you're not actively doing it, you feel this shift from your, your inner being, you know? And because we're not in tune with our inner being, we're not able to see it often. And that's what I think a spiritual journey kind of helps you do, is to be much more in tune with yourself and then kind of make the jumps when they need to be made yeah. for you to have the awakening that you need, you know? Uh, that's that's yeah. fair. So did you come over here and start acting um as did you carry that on over here no i haven't carried it on oh, just yeah, yet yeah. i'm considering it yeah. you know i mean my living situation in the uk is a bit different but um at the moment i'm working um and i'm working in an educational in, in the educational sector at the moment um but yeah if the opportunity arises i'll probably work my way through it and see what um i do have um hopes or desires to achieve that as well eventually i'm just still trying to figure it uh, figure out how to do it I didn't I, um, I, do you know what if I'm honest with you I didn't realize how young you were <laughs> I like and for someone that's you know gone on their journey and done so many different things so far like you've definitely like because I've followed you as well on Instagram right. and, and I see you always active and like doing doing things I mean what what's um are you still and do you still go back to uh the manor and the yeah um yeah the nice thing about the monastery or about this spiritual practice is that it's not just something that you need to perform or practice in that particular setting but you can kind of learn how to take those gems and then apply them in your own life so um what, what's the biggest gems would you say that you've taken i would definitely say the meditative practice has been a powerful gem um we would wake up every morning in the monastery and do at least two hours of meditation every day and you know, at first I used to be all mental about it and be like, oh, I could use this time to do so many other things. But now I'm realizing, yo, getting those two hours is was a luxury because the way the world is pushing us, it's just so fast paced and so difficult. But yeah, I learned how to do meditation at home. I usually do my meditative practice on a regular almost every day. Actually, every day I have to. <laughs> what do you mean almost every day? <laughs> every day I have to engage in my spiritual practice. Um, you know, we study scriptures and we do like online programs as well where we read and discuss some of these spiritual topics with others um, and kind of still keep connecting with the energy and that um, you know still helps me feel like I'm connecting with that spiritual energy from the temple mm. even though I'm not physically yeah. within it yeah. yeah that's fair so so what's kind of like important for you like right this moment in your life mm. where, where you're at what's what's like your main focus and your your goals and what are you looking to achieve at this moment right. in time? Yeah, it's interesting you asked me this. I was actually thinking about it a while ago is that I've only been living in, you could say, the real world where I'm having <laughs> to like, you know, work a job and, you know, survive materially um, for a year. Right. And I, I'm just about to come, I think, yeah, in mid-November going December is when I'll have actually done a full year outside the monastery for the f my first full year outside. And, and how, how was lifestyle at the monastery different compared to... Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep... Oh, I mean, you know, when you're living in the monastery, you don't have to think about bills. You don't have any bills, first of all. Um, you... All that's taken care of, your food's taken care of, your clothing's taken care of, your basic needs, your toothpaste, your soap, all of that. Everything is kind of covered. And you don't have to pay for... And you don't have to pay. But what you, ha you, you basically have to commit to doing service. Right. And, so, and how the temples work is based on your nature. 
that you find an intensity that suits your personality. So some people worked in the gardens because they loved gardening work. Some people loved working with the cows, so they went to work at the cows in the farm. I love to talk and love to share wisdom and just have discussions. So I was doing university programs. So I'd go to UCL, Queen Mary, and um, you know, join their spiritual societies there and just have discussions with different individuals about spiritual topics because the the youth are kind of into that. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. So th- that would be your like your reciprocation with having everything taken care of, you know. Right. And you know, you'd wake up early in the morning. You have a particular kind of regimen that we're following every day. You know, from as early as four o'clock in the morning. Morning and um, yeah, so that, that's obviously so different because I don't have to think about where am I getting my next meal from. All that's being provided, you know. Where am I getting my clothing? I just need to go to my leader and be like, "Hey, my um, my robes ripped up. I need to get a new robe, or I need trousers. I'm going to this place. Can you organize for me this?" And everything would get sorted out for you. Wow. Whereas when you go outside <laughs> and you're living in the real world, you got to do it all. You have to yeah. figure it all by yourself. And I'm just like. Rah, my my compassion for people who've been living in this world like this is insane you know mm-hmm. um i just recently was dealing with um you know you know when you're working in a, in a company and you hear like you know chatter or like gossip amongst workmates and stuff like that and i was just hearing some stuff and um i was talking to my mom about it and i was telling my mom oh you know i can't believe people would say this about somebody else and this and that and the other and i'll be like that's the work environment for you son welcome to the real yeah. world and i'm like whoa this is how it is yeah so it, yeah. It, at the moment it's been just trying to learn and figure out how to actually really live in this world and really live out of it with the teachings of spirituality that we learn because we tell a lot of people who come to the temple you can live this spiritual life in your homes so now I'm, I'm having to be that example <laughs> and really yeah yeah it. and it's, it can be quite challenging now. oh crazy <laughs> super crazy cuz yeah, cuz i am um, it's quite funny isn't it how you said it's like the outside world is crazy when a lot of people they'll look at a place like the the temple and they'll assume like a lot of people are crazy that probably go to the temple like they're, <laughs> they're just not it's just them environment uh, environmental changes that are just different from yeah them. yeah yeah because um, it's a whole different vibe you know it is you know, it's you're massive. waking up at four o'clock in the morning by 4 30 we're all in the temple room the curtains open and we've got deities and we're we're doing all these prayers to the deities and um you know to divinity and how we understand divinity and it's a party. We're dancing yeah. from like 4.30 all up to like 7 a.m., <laughs> you know? And it was just, it's a whole different reality. But you'd see that from the outside and you'd be like, no, that's crazy. I wouldn't do that. But for us, that was, it was lit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone just, everyone just seems super, like, really happy there to be yeah. honest with you. And it, that, that was something that, when, so I, when I went there last year, just randomly, I remember a random person coming up to me and they were like, can I show you around? Do you want something to eat? And they were like, the hospitality was just absolutely insane. So I can, I can really see how people can get really drawn into a place like that. Yeah. Because in the outside world, you know, it's nothing. Yeah. Even looking at you, mate, I'm I'm just on the other side. And I can say the thing about spirituality or that I've learned from my experience is that naturally just makes you love others. You know, you you start to have this awareness of yourself as a spiritual being looking for love. And then you realize I'm not alone in this. Everyone in this world is looking for love, is actually looking for happiness in how they understand it. So that billionaire, that pauper on the street, they're all looking for the same thing and they're trying to find it in how they understand it. Their version of it. And so because I've had this awakening that I'm also this spiritual being looking for love and happiness, I just have more love when I'm dealing with others, more compassion, you know, more patience. And that's why you feel when you enter that kind of a space, people are loving you so much. You're like, wait, is this, what is the catch? <laughs> what am I, where am I going to yeah, have to that's pay? Right. You, know, you, you think do, you do it's feel so like unnatural, that. right? Yeah, 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 but it's because, you know, it's the byproduct of a spiritual practice. It's meant to awaken your heart to loving others mm. and helping others on their journey of loving themselves as well, because we're going through that internal journey of self-love and, um, um, you know, loving what's around us simultaneously. I, I think, like how I 
have it in my head as well is there's a big karma thing with all of this is that mm. what you give out to the world is generally what you should end up what you get back what you get back yeah so, so if you if you like give out hate or hurt people then the high chance that that's going to come back to you in different ways but if you're giving out love and that's what you truly want for yourself yeah then surely it's going to come back in it might not come back in exactly how you want it to yeah but, but it, you will feel it you yeah. will feel that reciprocation yeah there's just there's a way it's, yeah, when you when you open yourself up to just being this instrument of giving love. Like I, I do this affirmation with some people and I tell them when you wake up every morning, remind yourself, I'm made of love. I'm made to give love. I'm made to receive love. Oh, divine energy, oh Krishna, please engage me in your loving service and teach me how to love. Um, and It's quite interesting yeah. though with affirmations. It's, it's, sometimes we hear these things, but why do you think we forget them? Why? Why? Do you think like we have to remind ourselves? Of yeah, this? you constantly. Yes, it's a thing you constantly have to remind yourself because it's our tendency to forget. Mm. The scriptures actually talk about this. They say we've got like four defects. Um, the first defect is that you've got imperfect senses. So your senses can't always perceive things as they truly are, you know, ever been in a situation where, you know, at times you, you're like, it's dark in the house and you turn on the lights and you, it's like, there's a ghost, right? <laughs> and your senses tell you, but there's really no ghost, but you kind of, you know, so your we've imagination. got, yeah, so you've got imperfect senses and because of your imperfect senses, you'll be led into illusion. That's your second, our second deficit will be led to illusion. So at times we we'll perceive things in the wrong ways. Um, and then yeah, we've got imperfect senses, you're then bound to illusion, which will ultimately mean that you make mistakes. And that's our third deficit. Um, you make mistakes, you won't do things perfectly. And then to cover up our mistakes, what do we do is that we cheat and we lie, you know? Um, yeah, and so I think when you're getting through this spiritual journey, you're kind of working from this space of authenticity where you can kind of be more real and, you know, just accept and let go of our imperfections and, you know, who we are as individuals in that external show and just be honest and real with who we are. And then, yeah, your journey becomes a little bit more sweeter, in, yeah. you know, connecting with others and living it, with others like that. It's, it's quite un uh, funny when you like saying about we lie and we cheat. I think that in the end, what happens is you lie and cheat. You might get away with it to the other person, but you're probably lying and cheating to yourself. In yeah, the end. yeah. And that's holding you back from that growth, that journey of that next evolution of what you might need to become in the process. Exactly. Because you're working with a performance, you know. Yeah. I always say the Oscars don't need to go to the actors. Like the world, everyone needs an Oscar because people are so professional at it, you know. Mm. Even in the UK, for example, you ask me, how are you doing? And I'm all right, you know. When you've just, just had the, the easy answer, you know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we're just so caught up in this act. And it's like the spirituality is this journey to strip away the act and just be yourself in whole. You know, you're good and you're bad and just be, mm. you know, transparent. I, I think I've, I've, what I've also found is some people don't like to emphasize and encourage like that they're not feeling good as well. So mm. they they put the mask on to to push it down. Right. Rather than kind of bringing it out to the open. Yeah. And, then, and I think the more you expose it, the, the more it goes away. That's my belief. Yeah. But some people also have the belief that the more I push it down. And I don't think about it, I, the more I ignore it, it will go. Yeah. yeah and the, I, that never works. Yeah. You know? As we mentioned earlier, the, the body keeps a score. So even if you suppress something, eventually it comes out in like a different way. And, mm. you know, you might not be able to trace how it comes out, but when it does come out, it can be, you know, worse, you know, because you're letting it brew and ruminate in not the best of ways. A hundred percent. Yeah. And and how, how have you found it going to the universities, by the way? So you've like had to go and speak to students because I know Jay Shetty's uh, had to do that in the past as well. And I've I've seen other monks that they would go to universities and they talk to people. Yeah. How, how do you find that experience? Yeah. So the, the, the temple that I was serving at, yeah, they have this like wonderful like youth um, society. It's called the KC Sox. Um, and they run different KC socks across different universities. And it's basically just like a sacred space where individuals can come and discuss spiritual phenomena and topics and, you know, be able to get that break from the madness of university. And you do get a lot of inquisitive people because especially at university, you're yeah, being here with a lot and it's like you're questioning a lot. You're trying to think about where do I get my next job? What's this? What's that? Do I even like my degree? <laughs> you know, and you're going through this maze and you're questioning and you're having a lot of whys. So it was nice being in that space because then you can get to churn really the wise with different people and then you watch them evolve. I have one guy I remember I met at the temple and um, no, 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 at, at the university program. 
and we carried on having a conversation and now and he took some time out moved into the monastery and i came out and he's this like redefined version of himself which is so cool so it's just always been nice being with university students in that way because i guess they're more inquisitive at the time mm. it's, it's like a window period to question because once you're out of it and you're caught up in the rat race of work and paying bills and mortgages, et cetera, you don't have time. Yes. But they've got time a little bit to be able to contemplate these things. So it was nice having these discussions with them. And, and did you have, have you ever found any um, disadvantages or cons to uh, being a Harry Krishna? Have you ever found any challenges around any of it that, mm. that, have, te like, that have tested you with it all? Or... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> That's a very interesting question. <laughs> I'd say it like this. Okay, imagine the space for me, and this is just my subjective view. It's it's a beautiful space. But you can imagine it's a hospital which is coming to give people spiritual inspiration. And part of your treatment is that you become a doctor as well. So, you know, you're coming in there um, trying to unlock this heart of love and connecting with divinity within yourself and partly how you do that is by trying to help it being unlocked in other people's lives so having a deeper understanding of it and being able to pass that on and so you're dealing with individuals who are not only doctors but who are also patients and they've also got the four defects as well they've also got their imperfect senses they're making mistakes and so i wouldn't say it was a disadvantage but it was a learning curve for me to realize that you know the, um, not everyone no, might have the answers exactly yeah no not everyone might have the answers or not everyone might be what they present that we're all just in the same struggle out here trying to make it you know everyone is kind of going through the thick of it and so i mean i had ignorantly i had ignorantly put myself in circumstances where i just had blind faith in persons because they yeah. held that position as a Hare krishna well well generally um, when a, a person speaks of like that confidence of knowing what they're talking about right. most people assume they've got their they've shit they've got their exactly <laughs> they've got their control. shit together and, yeah. and so i had kind of placed my trust and my heart in some individuals and then they managed to fail me successfully <laughs> oh, right wow but then how, how in in what way yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'd relied on them in certain ways or, you know, given my heart out in certain ways and got to find out different things afterwards. Maybe that they perceived me different or that what they had shared with me is not really how they felt. Right. Um, you know. And which which I, is a bit against uh, what you were speaking about earlier, where um, it's about authenticity. Yeah, and, appreci and understanding of different people from where they're at, you know. Um, but yeah, I just... I, it, it, I, it was more so a failure to myself. I wouldn't say it's an issue with the space or with the institution. I would just say maybe it was me blindly, you know, mm -hmm. taking shelter. And so I was kind of awakened by being shaken up like, hey, you also have to be intelligent in your decision making. Mm -hmm. You have to be intelligent with who you associate yourself with. Just because someone is wearing robes and, um, you know, saying that they, they chant certain mantras doesn't mean that they'll treat you with the same love, care and respect that others will, you know. I've met people who are not Hare Krishnas who've treated me with way much better love, care and affection mm -hmm. than some Hare Krishnas have. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's a that there's a problem or that I had an issue with the space of the institution. It was more so myself not mm. taking responsibility or sovereignty of myself and, you know, kind of controlling who I'm giving my heart to because I gave my heart to the wrong people. And then I kind of got stung at the end, you know? Yeah. I think, I think the kind of challenge as well is that you are who you are at the end of it mm. and you can adopt certain values and, and, ideas and cause but ultimately you're going to be you got to be true to yourself right with that because it's important to to take the positives but not lose yourself in the process and i mm. think the challenge in whether it's religion or anything else is taking the good but not my dad always used to say to me take all the good and leave the bad yeah yeah and, yeah. and, and that's you know and I, I think it's what is good for you and what isn't good for you is it's really defining what that looks like yeah um, so that you are loyal to yourself still. Exactly, exactly. Because um, a lot of people are ending up being loyal to other things and then disloyal to themselves. To themselves, yeah. The and then you, you spend a couple of years and you look back and you're like, you know, I, I already sold myself, you know, to um, this idea of being somebody that I'm not. 
mm. and I've been living a performance in trying to be myself. And we and that's we're, scary. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I remember going to the the manor, and there'd be people there for t- 20, 30 years at this. Yeah, and it's like I'm not saying they would, but could you imagine one day waking up thinking? that I haven't been entirely true to myself. Yeah, and uh, you get circumstances like yeah. that. I I do know people who, no, and not just in the Hare Krishna temple, but in different spaces who, you know, kind of got into it and, you know, sold themselves to the idea of what this might have to offer and sold themselves too much that they forgot themselves. Mm. And then they've kind of been in it for so long and their body and their being has acclimatized to this environment. But then now they start to realize, oh, I've... The thrill of everything has been exciting, but now where am I at? And I'm not really being myself and I'm not happy in who I am right now. And then they become frustrated and then they end up doing a much more radical shift back to their old ways, which is what we don't want. But I think it's nice having these kind of spaces that maybe, and this is why I appreciate about the practice or what I associated with is that it gives you a manual that you can kind of take and then adjust and work with in your life and your currency is your sincerity you know it's it's one of those things you can perform but if you perform it won't feel the same way oh, you know you, you can't fake it you mm. know you can't fake trying to love others mm. <laughs> it's yeah. just so hard and when you do fake it people will feel it they'll feel it's a performance when you make it genuine from yourself even if you don't have it and you, you you're open about your deficit um, people feel that and they appreciate a much more real, honest exchange. Vulnerable person. Yeah. yeah than and they do someone that's always putting on a, a good show. Yeah, a good show. And because it's like, okay, you know, when will the performance end? And then, you you know, you're caught, you've, you're caught in your, in stopping your performance. And then people are like, oh my God, this is, this is not you. This is, you've lied to us, but you know, he just lied to himself because he was stuck in this performance. Mm. And now he's allowing for his real self to grow, but you guys don't know his real self because he never showed it to you because he forgot that part of himself, you know? That's, that's yeah. Uh, Cause um, we, we spoke about this outside of the room as well. And I've, I wanted to get your view on here is mm. with um, religion, would you, would you say Harry Krishna is a religion? In one sense, you could classify it as a religion. Um, if you look at religion as um, a practice that lets you know, understand, and love God. From that basis, yeah, you could say it's a religion. But if you're looking at religion from like the constructs that we've seen of how to behave and how to be, etc., I wouldn't put them in the same box. Right. You know, I'd more so put it as maybe a spiritual practice or a spiritual um encyclopedia <laughs> yeah you yeah, know that kind of gives you different spiritual opportunities based on what you're ready for like because that. how do you find because like a lot of this information was uh, put together a long long time ago how do you find that it works for the modern day world so mm. i feel I, I was saying this to you earlier that th- because it was written so long ago it felt absolutely necessary at that period of at time that period yeah how do you find is it would you say it's fit for purpose in this day to day can it be fit for purpose or does there need to be a more modern approach in in it now to help it evolve into 2023 into right um you know i'd say with the vedic teachings so like teachings from books like the bhagavad gita or the Srimad bhagavatam what's amazing about them is that they've withstood the test of time you can read the bhagavad gita and find a lot of things that relate to you right now in how you live and how you you function in your life in the Srimad Bhagavatam which is like the postgraduate study of the Bhagavad Gita you get examples like a wide plethora of people who have had a particular consciousness that we can relate to you know so I can give you an example this is a guy called Ajamil who you know was from a very like respectful family, very, very like nice, honorable, simple guy. He goes out on the streets um, and as he's walking um, and perusing the streets, he sees a couple being naughty externally. So, you know, like hooking up in front of, in the public, you know, and then that corrupts his mind. And then he's like, hey, I want to explode this. And then he finds that girl and then he's with that girl his entire life. And that's something we can relate to in our modern day world. At times, you know, you hear stories of, you know, a guy meeting this girl and he's in a committed situation and just gets drifted. So Mm. that becomes something you can relate to, you know, and 
how he goes through his journey of awakening even after making such a mistake it's something we can relate to in our lives today and you can have conversations of you know if someone makes these kinds of mistakes how can they bounce back from it so i think the teachings and the stories and the um the principles they have withstood the test of time and they they are still applicable and relevant to us today maybe the challenge is in how it's being communicated to the people today and that's maybe where persons like myself or or at least or, or i you know like my mentor for example they're attempting to make these teachings become more relevant to a person living in 2023 because it is relatable it is practical it is stuff that you can test you know um in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about uh, so uh, the character called arjuna he asks why am i at times impelled to making a bad decision <laughs> you know and we all experienced it you know what you know that something's wrong george i'm not supposed to do this you know but ra there's just an energy that's just like but well, there's no harm in doing it so and then krishna takes you through this journey that first you'll contemplate and then the, the the if you carry on with the contemplation it's going to be stuck within your mind it will probe you to act if you end up acting you've set that intention you get reciprocation from it but you don't get the same happiness so it makes you frustrated and then you kind of carry on in this pool so you know we That's can relate to I'm that like, yeah, right yeah, exactly yeah, definitely like yeah and the same scriptures are explaining this you know and it's so profound that that was written over 5000 years ago but that makes a lot of sense now so i think it's more so in how we're communicating the teachings that are there in today's for the postmodern psyche for the person living in the 21st century who's still who's living in their 95 who's been bombarded with social media and TikTok ads and all these kind of things how can we communicate these principles for them like that thank you for that I appreciate it. thank yeah. you for explaining it like that, to be fair. It, <laughs> right. it does it does make sense and and I wanted to ask you what what would be what has been like the biggest eye opening moment for you like on your spiritual journey mm the biggest i mean there's always different moments it's it's one of those it's like it never ends my one of my mentors is an amazing personality his name is ananta gopal i don't know if you'll ever watch this but if he does hey ananta <laughs> um and he mentioned to me that um because he's been practicing for very many years he's been in the monastery for many years and he just told me this thing that has always stuck with me that every day he is finding more realizations to affirm that his journey is accurate and so every day when he wakes up he's getting a new realization a new moment something that kind of sticks by him and you know and i think there's so many serendipitous things that are happening in our lives we're just not attuned to see them we you know just, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. we we just we're not able to it's like you know people are still being provided with food they're still being sustained so many things are still happening even if they don't think about it mm -hmm. and we we become so acclimatized to thinking that that's just the norm whereas in reality it's a blessing i mean we, you can see what's happening right now like in in gaza for example it's so horrendous what you're seeing and it's like oh my god so when you look at your life and you're seeing that you're having everything being provided every day you're not having to have the same anxiety of will i you know be dying tomorrow yeah. um in the same way then you you're able to acknowledge the blessing that is your life I, you know I, I, i think the issue with things like what's going on in gaza is that you're so disconnected from it mm. you almost pretend it's like well not pretend but you just don't even really believe it exists it, exactly where know? for somebody actually in it in it yeah see, like living in it like it's r really real for them yeah and, and i think because we're having these discussions and these conversations about it um then you can now look back and be like oh my life as george how blessed have i been yeah you know and you can have this active realization that the discourse of my life has been filled with a lot of blessings Mm. and and that's what krishna consciousness means being aware aware of or conscious of how divinity has really placed you positively through you. your your journey of life you know and yeah because we get very caught up in that trap of what's not working for us uh -huh. rather than what is actually working exactly. for us and, and being grateful for that that's it yeah and so i could yeah i could say there's no Every day there's an eye-opening moment somehow. I can say even this experience with you right now is validating for me as well, you know, this experience and that I'm actually on the right journey and on the right track because I'm put in a position where I have to talk about it. Well, it, you know? it goes back to what you were saying as well, which we forget. We like we need reminding all the time. Yeah. Reminding about things. And, yeah. And I think 
like because there's so much information out there it's very quick to forget and get lost in all of the information out there that's it actually yeah because i forgot about that you know my mind always travels so and you had mentioned it yeah you know you asked earlier like why do we always forget you know mm. it's because of our imperfections that the the mind will always wander and it will disassociate with certain things because it's craving something new so you know you you know for example people know what a bad night out is like like when you've maybe had too many shots of tequila yeah. that you had in plan for right but then because over time you forget what that experience is like in its actual manifestation you go back again and you have even yeah, more yeah. shots right yeah. because you've forgotten but if you constantly remind yourself regularly of what these experiences are like if you constantly remind yourself i'm a being of love if you constantly remind yourself i'm here to serve others if you constantly remind yourself things of divine consciousness then it sticks more mm. you know that's why i guess even for true why the academic system exists is because in that in a young age you're able to repeat more without getting bored mm -hmm. so the kids can repeat repeat until it sticks you know so that's why we need that repetition we need that constant reminder i think i think know? the important thing is at that point in time is that you're repeating the right things that are actually going to be of best service to mm. you you know because so i think sometimes the problem with information out there that you're being told is is it's not exactly what you might need for yourself all the time right and, right you know, i think that's the challenge with academics is, is that you know, making sure that you're in the right environment for you to actually really grow and prosper in. Yeah, and I think it's, hopefully it's evolving now where you see, like I've been to a few schools and I've seen they're kind of customizing the academic system to suit the nature of the students. Um, like one of the schools, I think it's called Townley Manor, I was there and I was seeing some kids are into like farming and stuff. So as part of the school project, they're trying to, you know, create like a, like a garden and stuff where they can grow their own produce and stuff like that. Like you see all these different, uh, slowly we're getting to a space where people are becoming more attuned to working within their nature and encouraging others to work within our nature because, you know, our normal academic system was more so trying to judge how like a monkey, a cow and a pig, how effective they are climbing a tree yes but they'd all yeah. be climbing they will all have different strengths 100%. you know so that i think it's sense. evolving in that way and i think the more we're having this kind of discussions and topics parents can go back to their kids and not just be thinking about what can i give to my child that will make them get the most money mm -hmm. but more so what can i give to my child that will make them most situated in their being mm -hmm. so they can find you know the whatever goals they need whatever if it's financial or social emotional relationship wise 100%. how they can be the better version of themselves yeah and and how is uh, your mom now oh my mom's good oh yeah so, so, so yeah what yeah. happened with that all in right oh yeah i left you in a cliffhanger yeah. there didn't yeah. i <laughs> yeah no so i so moved on into the temple and then i carried on because there was actually so th there's a deity um in the temple known as nishinga dave and Nishinga Dave is like the personification of div divinity in divine's protective form. Um, and so I was seeing, and he manifests in this like half man, half lion that rips open the chest of this individual. It's, it's quite, you know, it's like more like it's scary. Like when you look at the picture, when I first heard, I was like, what is this? But you see a small boy kind of garlanding this lion. And the story was that his father was, um, he thought that he was a king, he was a great person. And um, his son comes, but he has awareness of God. So his son says, actually, you know, we, all your strength and all your abilities, dad, are coming from a divine source. They're not really from you. So you kind of need to humble yourself down, Papa. <laughs> and the, the father, obviously, having a huge ego, got really upset and was actually trying to kill his son. You because know, of it. yeah, because it's like, what do you mean that you know? What 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 what, what does it mean to be a divine? Uh, what was it? Divine, like um, it comes from a divine source. You yeah, say. yeah, yeah. What, yeah. Does, what does that even? That really, our abilities are coming from a, div a, a, a an energy higher than ourselves that we can, you know, label as God. You know, some people say the universe. You know, and we understand it from the. Krishna conscious perspective that yeah it is God and God has he can take many wear many hats different forms he's got that ability if we've got ability to wear different hats right. surely the supreme can do the it's same so yeah he was making the point that actually you know your energy and ability is coming from God um, but his father was quite upset and then he tries to kill him and he reaches a stage where the divine himself comes to subdue his father um, and actually ends up killing his father. And so 
the the son he comes to to the lord and asks the lord you know i don't want anything from you you've given me everything you've t- I, i've always had awareness of your consciousness but i'd like you to deliver my father's consciousness so that he can be a much more happier person in his future life and the lord was like you know what because of your good deeds he will be awakened and he will go through this journey of awakeness so i was being told this story and i remember asking the monk who was telling me the story okay so if i be like that small little boy and i pray to this lion guy and i ask him to protect my mom will he do it and uh the monk was like of course he will very confidently so i was like i am going to do it and Two years down the line, on the anniversary of the appearance of this energy, I remembered my mom of the appearance of Lorna Shingadev. I remembered my mom, and I called her, and I was like, "Hey, how are you doing?" And she was like, "Fun, you've called me. I just got, you know, my um, uh, I just came back from a checkup from hospital, and my cancer is on remission." And so when you know she was like, "Oh, my cancer is cleared and everything," that served as like a symbol for me that oh, I was worshiping this lion guy, and then he kind of reciprocated with me. So maybe that's the sign I need to keep on going. Um, and yeah, she's been okay ever since. She's living her best life oh, now wow. back home in Kenya. You know, um, yeah, still working. My mom is really, really hard worker. It's really hard to get her to not work. Um, she always likes to work to serve others to entertain. So she's doing well. She's doing really, really Good. well. And, oh, I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. And she's kind of affirmed it to me you know that I should carry on trying to serve serve God and higher purpose in this she's life. learned to accept it um, yeah yeah yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and she always encourages me actually even at times when I'm struggling with my faith I'm struggling with everything I call my mom and she reestablishes it for me <laughs> she even sends me I don't know if you yeah you get all I get all these messages on you know like these threads that are sent and forwarded like thousands of times so she always gets I get this reminder for the day trust and have faith let go and mm-hmm. you know she's very very um, amazing at reminding me and keeping that faith so yeah. she's doing really holding good. you accountable as well yeah yeah are you practicing what you're preaching Ian? <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly so yeah. so what's a, so what's next for you on your journey have you what's next wow have i thought i'm still trying to figure <laughs> that out <laughs> um at the moment yes i think you know getting more situated in in london and i'm trying to do and hold more forums and spaces where we can have this kind of discussions um trying to set up a few things coming soon so i will definitely be I'll probably come back once a few things are established and be like, "Hey guys, <laughs> yeah, why not?" Yeah, but really trying to create more spaces where we can have this kind of conversations, more spaces where people can't fear um, talking about stuff to do with God, because I think, especially in, you could probably relate to this. There's like a weird energy when people talk about God that people just divert from. It's as if God's been rep- misrepresented so badly. Mm-hmm. um and i feel like now we should be comfortable talking about god and about god's amazingness or you know or even having the questions and challenging does god exist and having things around that i think it's you know i, I think like how i represent it in my head is is that i'm just very open minded to hearing these things and talking about these things yeah I, like it doesn't mean i have to adopt it in its entirety but there's always like little gems that you can take from conversations like these and yeah. in the past that could help you in your life 100% it's, it's, it goes back to the saying like what have you really got to lose exactly and, you and, know yeah um, and what's a, what's 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 to be scared of if you, you know there's yeah. nothing to be scared of just well, explore right. it and you know learn from it and then you can look back and be like you know in the bhagavad gita what's amazing is um so krishna gives all these keys to arjuna who is his friend and it becomes his disciple but then at the end of him giving him all these different nuggets of wisdom he tells him deliberate and then you decide what you want to do what was that word deliberate like think about it you know yeah, yeah. he doesn't tell him you must do this he doesn't put him in a box mm. i think why people even veer away from religions and topics about god is because we're kind of being forced to be in a box and it's like you either have to do this or this will happen mm-hmm. you either follow this or it's eternal damnation but no Krishna is saying no no deliberate on it think about what i have to say yeah. and then you decide what you. will yeah, yeah you get the hold yourself accountable you take sovereignty over yourself mm-hmm. you hold yourself responsible live with your decisions yeah and yeah. i think if we can you know give people that wisdom and then be like okay we've given it to you because i feel like people deserve to know this i feel like it could help like understanding the self meditation yoga different 
conversations that awaken your consciousness they really have such a powerful effect in people's minds mm -hmm. and i've seen it not only with myself but i've met so many people who whose lives have been transformed um right. because of it um countless examples i could give that i don't think we should throw the baby with the bath water i think like you know people should still know about it even though maybe they and we should be ready to present it in a way that they can listen mm -hmm. and connect with it and then they can take more charge in their lives and live a much more happier, more fulfilled life. Because I get this feeling like I'd be happy if more people are happier. And if I can aid for more people to be happy and to live a better version of themselves, then that for me is fulfilling. Yeah. And that, yeah. you almost see that as your purpose. Yeah. No, nice. No. It's important. I think it's really important to have that purpose. Um, to be honest, I think for a lot of people, some well, for definitely a lot of people, they don't, they don't have that purpose. They, they're still trying to figure it out or or they have no desire to have a purpose. But yeah. I think that's really important in life to feel that internal kind of fulfillment. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I really understand it. And and I think the other way I look at that as well is, is that if you know it's helped you or helped people around you, then surely it's going to help yeah. more people. And, and, naturally, people. Yeah, and naturally when something works so well for you, you want to share it. You yeah. know, you know, like if you found like a business model or something that's okay, unless it's you, you want to like, you know, become a monopoly, <laughs> you know, no, 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 it makes you know sense. naturally it makes sense. you, you want, when you have something so good and you, you know, I'm sure you've ever dealt with it. Like you see a friend maybe going through something and you know that you've got a solution for it. And so you're always having this feeling of just experience it. I, I, trust me, you know, I, I think, I think <laughs> the, the only challenge that you have to be mindful of or be responsible with is sometimes the issue that what works well for you doesn't always work, work. for everyone else yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and when you are giving advice it's making sure you're doing it on the basis that that's what's best for that individual not mm. what might be best for you exactly which is exactly a, which is a, a hard a hard thing to get right yeah when in giving advice more so we're always trying to be we're, we're giving it from our own subjective experience mm. without being having that empathic view of what they've experienced and stuff. And, mm. you know, I remember, and this actually was a game changer for me when I, I was going through a difficult time and I opened up to a friend about it. And I told him everything that was going on and he looked at me and he said, you know, Ian, if I'm being honest with you, I can't relate with anything that you've shared with me, <laughs> but I'm here for you. Right. And that for me hit me more than someone being like, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. Because the reality is you probably don't, mm -hmm. you know, you you probably have not experienced it as, I'm, as I am experiencing it, but you don't. But I, what I really appreciate about that response was, yeah, I'm not trying to show you that I know, I'm just trying to Presence. show you that I care. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you know, sense. people won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, and when they know how much you care for them, then they'll be inquisitive to find out what you have to say, mm. you know, like that. Yeah. Do you know what that and that is a really valid point. I think I think what a lot of us probably under, struggle to understand is sometimes it's just being present with that person who's going through it as opposed mm. to giving them the answer to their problem. Exactly. Some people just want to be heard because it's an opportunity for when people talk about their problems just get it off their chest yeah just release at it. times you just want to just i just want to let, let it out run. i don't yeah don't give me a solution man yeah. i don't want your solution no, no, that's right. people, <laughs> yeah and, and i think by sometimes giving people the answer to that you're you're almost forcing it back down their throat yeah about what they've got yeah to do. so yeah no it's re i think it's really important that to be present to let that person have a voice. Yeah. Not always try and solve that problem for them, but just let them hear them out. And Exactly. Yeah, I'm so lucky. So one of my mentors, an amazing, um, you know, guy, his name is Jai. And I have this Jai, really... Uh, yeah. Glory. Uh, yeah, like all glories. Yeah, he's Jai Jagnath. He's a cool guy. And um, one thing I like about our relationship is I, you know, he has his very, very he has so much wisdom he would lived in the monastery for i think over 